I'd like you to turn in your Bibles one more time to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. For the past eight weeks, we've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit one by one, and this is the final week uh, of the fruit of the Spirit. Actually, I only have one more message in this whole series on the Holy Spirit, uh, and that'll be next week uh, with the question, what is holiness? And uh, we'll be talking about that one, uh, and then we'll be done with that whole series, and then it's Christmas time. And uh, so we got to get in the mood uh, for that one, in the spirit of that. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. What I've tried to emphasize each week is that these nine characteristics ought to be true of every Christian, every Christian. Uh, If you're walking in the Spirit, these nine characteristics will be true. Uh, in your life, uh, and uh, obviously some sometimes a little bit more so than others, uh, and some a little bit later than others. All fruit doesn't ripen at the same time, uh, but all of it will be there and be a part of you. This is what real Christianity is, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and so when you're looking at a person uh, and you see that they're gentle and, and uh, uh, you see, for instance, that they're loving or they've got joy, they've got peace, you know that the Holy Spirit's working in them, uh, and hopefully uh, over a period of time, you'll see all nine of these fruit evidenced in that individual, particularly if that individual is you. Uh, and that's what we pray for. So let's bow together in prayer and we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this opportunity once again to share your word. I thank you that it is the word of God. We can trust it. We can know uh, that the, these are your words to us, not just thoughts, not just the truths, but these are your words. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that we would take the word of God to our hearts today and allow you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Some people have the reputation of being control freaks. They, they want to control everything in life except themselves. However, there's a lot of things in life that you just can't control. Every now and then when we plan, for instance, an a old-fashioned day or a picnic outside, folks will say, Pastor, uh, we're going to be outside in that day. Will you pray? And I have to tell them, sorry, I'm in sales, not management. Uh, you know, that, that's really up to God to determine what the weather's going to be like. Uh, even though you may try, you can't control other people. I heard about a, a bride who was very anxious on her wedding day, and uh, as she stood back there, uh, and the groom was in place, the preacher was in place, she got very, very nervous. And uh, she said, I don't think I can make it. So the maid of honor said, now listen, here's all you do. Look down. First of all, just watch the aisle. She said, when you get to the altar, look at the altar as you work your way up. When you get up there, look at the groom. Uh, She thought that made good sense. So as she walked down the aisle, people could hear her softly say, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. No, she won't alter him. Uh, She'd like to think she could, but but it's not going to happen. I I saw a sign recently from... uh, uh, the late President Teddy Roosevelt, it made me laugh, but it said, if you could kick the person in the pants most responsible for your trouble, you wouldn't sit down in a month. Uh, and and that's, that's true. It's a lack of self-control uh, on our parts. Uh, now, I'm trying to insert some humor here because some of you look like you're half asleep, uh, and I know you haven't caught on to time change yet, so bear with me with one more. I heard about a stunt pilot who was selling rides uh, for a single-engine airplane. Um, and this pastor really wanted to ride on it, but he told the guy he was just charging too much. He said, I can't afford that. And the guy said, come on, i got to have money for gas and stuff. The pastor said, well, that might be, but I can't afford that. Uh, and they argued about it for quite a while. And finally, the pilot said, all right, I'll tell you what. I'll take you both up for the price of one if you promise not to utter one sound on the flight. So they got in the plane. He said, if you, if you utter one sound, then the price is doubled. And they agreed. They get on the plane, and the plane takes off, and it's up in the air. And the pilot does all kinds of stunts. He dives. He turns it over uh, back and forth, just going every which way, trying everything he could think of, till finally he's just exhausted, and the, the passengers didn't make a sound. So the pilot finally lands, uh, and as he's helping the pastor out, the pilot said, you know, I made moves up there that frightened even me. Uh, And yet, you didn't say a word. You must have incredible self-control. 
And the pastor thanked the pilot. He said, I must admit, there was one time when I almost, almost said something. The pilot said, when was that? He said, well, when my wife fell out. <laughs> That's self-control right there. <laughs> we, uh, we started off with love. Love is the, the first fruit of the fruit of the Spirit. Today we come to the last fruit, and that's temperance or self-control. And I think these two virtues were placed first and last because love is the primary fruit. That's what drives all the others. Self-control is the virtue that holds them all together. So love is the engine that drives them, and self-control is the glue that holds them all together uh, so that they work effectively for God's sake. So I want to do something a little bit different today. I want to start by asking some questions. <clears throat> and then we'll get into two major truths that go along with these questions. And the major question is this, and I'll throw some underneath it. Is any area of your life out of control? This characteristic of a Christ follower causes us to focus more on ourselves than it does on our relationships with other people. All the other ones, you can see how they have to do with how we relate to other people because God wants us to relate to others the way he does, with love, with joy, with peace, with long-suffering, with gentleness, with meekness, uh, on and on. He wants us to have all of those things so that we can be a good testimony towards others. But this one is about us, self-control. Uh, and he's saying, okay, you can't go nudging somebody else on this one. This is about you. If we properly exercise the fruit of self-control, it will benefit those around us. That's always going to be true. In fact, in some ways, you might consider this part or this fruit as the most important. Because without self-control, the works of the flesh can't be overcome. And the other elements of the fruit of the Spirit just won't be evident. But everybody struggles with self-control. I remember years ago, uh, we had a Christian school, and uh, a little kid got in trouble. Uh, and that wasn't anything new. Almost every day, this child got in trouble. And uh, so, since it was a Christian school, the teacher takes him out in the hallway and uh, sits down to talk to him. And uh, she says, now, you know, you need to understand something about the fruit of the Spirit. And she names all of them. But when she gets to self-control, this little fellow holds up his hand and said, hold it right there. That's the one I got trouble with. <clears throat> That's true for all of us at one time or another. We struggle with self-control. We all wish we had more of it. If we had more of it, we'd never have to go on diets. Uh, you know, if we had more of it, we'd never lose our temper. We'd have all kinds of friends and no enemies. Uh, but self-control is a struggle. Now, to see if there are areas where you might need more self-control... Let me ask you three questions. Uh, I got these three questions from a pastor down in Texas, uh, and it really made me search my heart, so I thought, well, I'm not the only one that's going to suffer. I'm going to make you suffer with these too, all right? So here it goes. First of all, how's your appetite? How's your appetite? By the way, I appreciate all the nice comments from folks about my losing weight. I don't recommend getting heart surgery to lose weight. Uh, it's just not the fun way to go. You know, it, it worked. Uh, I'm glad I did, that was one of the side products, uh, and I'm thankful for that. But I think we all fight it. But it's not, not just appetites for food. Uh, appetites for um, pleasure, for love, for acceptance, uh, and a lot of other things that we crave. But God has always given us normal, healthy ways to satisfy all of these appetites. The world the flesh and the devil want you to overindulge your appetite. Proverbs 23 and verse 1 says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, <clears throat> consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat. If thou be a man given to appetite, be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Now notice that he's saying, look at uh, when you sit down to eat with somebody uh, that is over you, uh, Think carefully about what you're eating there uh, and put a knife to your throat because what he's feeding you is not just food. He's feeding you other appetites as well that are going to draw you into a life of sin. So be careful about that. A lack of control means that you want something and you want it right now. Right now. How much self-control do you have? Do you really practice uh, delayed gratification or do you just have to have it right now? 
1972, uh, some experiments were, were um, put in place, social experiments on self-control by, the Stanf- by Stanford University. Researchers reported uh, that they took 600 four-year-olds and they put each child in a room with a single marshmallow on the table. And they told each child, if you can sit here for 15 minutes and not eat that one marshmallow, we'll give you another marshmallow. And so they did this with 600 of the kids. Uh, Of the 600, only 30% of them were willing to wait for the extra marshmallow. They saw that one marshmallow and they thought, I got to have it. I got to have it now. Have you ever noticed sometimes the doctors will tell you, uh, you're going to have a blood test and you've got to fast for 12 hours. Now think about it. There may be a lot of times when you really don't eat anything anyway from 8 to 8. But because he's told you you can't eat, it drives you crazy. You're hungry from 8 o'clock until 8 o'clock. You're thinking of all these things. I wonder if I could just eat this if it would show. I wonder if I could have this. I wonder if I could have that. We have the same problem. We want it and we want it now. Now here's the interesting thing. The test didn't end with those marshmallows. They followed those kids as they grew into adolescence and young adulthood. The 30% who practiced self-control and got the extra marshmallow, were better adjusted socially, they were more dependable. In high school, they scored significantly higher on their SATs. So what's the point of the marshmallow test? Self-control actually affects every area of your life. That's why it's so important. That's why God includes it in this fruit. Second question here, do you have any uncontrolled ambition? Sometimes, we try to to bite off more than we can eat. Now, there's nothing wrong with ambition. We ought to all be ambitious to please God and and, and to serve God, but ambition has a dark side when it becomes selfish. Galatians 5, 19 to 20 uh, contains the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. I call it the weeds of the devil. Uh, And he gives you a list here. One of the sins of the flesh listed is emulations. That's a snazzy word that simply means selfish ambition. The Bible says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Isn't that interesting? He said, you you need to be looking at other people and looking at how to meet their needs and how to help them rather than gratifying yourself. But we're a selfish people. We've been taught that from childhood, uh, and we stay that way. It's all about us. It's never about what's best for the other person. It's what we want, what we have to have, uh, and that's what leads to trouble. A great illustration of selfish ambition uh, would be King David's son, Absalom. Absalom was a piece of work. The Bible says he was extremely handsome and vain. He had such thick hair that when he cut it each year, he would weigh it. I thought about that the other day. I could let my hair grow for 10 years and weigh it, and you'd be lucky to get an ounce. Uh, you know, but here, Absalom's weighing this thing uh, every year. Now, who would do that except a vain person? He wanted to become king, and he knew he was going to become king when his father died, but that wasn't soon enough. So he launched a sinister plot to get himself onto the throne. He enlisted 50 soldiers to go before him, and they would applaud him everywhere he went, kind of like uh, rock groupies. Uh, you know, uh, he'd come, and all these 50 soldiers are there, and they're applauding, and say, hey, Absalom, yay, Absalom. Uh, and uh, Absalom would work his way around, uh, and uh, he started, started going to the gates of the city. And there he would shake hands with people. He would meet people. He'd kiss babies. He'd talk about what a terrible king David was. In other words, he was a politician. He could have run for president here and probably got it. Uh, After a few months of this crusade of criticism, most of the people decided they wanted Absalom as king. So he attempted a hostile takeover. But instead of fighting his son, David was so heartbroken that David... Uh, vacated Jerusalem, and he left town barefoot, weeping with a few of his faithful men. Now, Absalom and his soldiers pursued after him. Uh, And in the heat of the battle, Absalom was riding a mule, and he rode into a thick stand of oak trees, and his hair uh, got caught 
uh, into the oak trees. The donkey kept going, and Absalom was hanging there. Uh, and now that's a bad hair day, by the way. Uh, you know, he, he's hanging there. David didn't want to harm his son, but his general Joab didn't feel the same way. When he found Absalom just hanging around, I like that one, he, he, he threw three spears into Absalom's heart. When David heard about it, his heart was broken and he cried out, Oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. It's, it's amazing to me. It, it's tough for parents to bury their children, even rebellious ones who are always clamoring for more. And yet David wept. David's heart was broken over his son. We live in a nation where most people want one thing, more. They want more food, they want more drink, they want more money, more toys, more cars, more channels, more pornography, more thrills, uh, more perks, more success. After a, uh, a few years of, of study, a survey was taken asking Americans all, across all economic levels exactly how much money it would take to make them happy. Not a single person responded that they were happy with what they had. Not a single person was happy with what they had. Why? Selfish ambition. Thirdly, do you have uncontrolled anger? Folks, anger is not a sin, but uncontrolled anger is a sin. Ephesians tells us to be angry and, and sin not. You can be angry. Jesus was angry as he overthrew the money changers. Uh, he was angry at what he saw was sinful, but he controlled his anger. Uh, and that's, that's crucial. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.26, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Remember Billy Sunday talking one time about a lady who came to him to rationalize her angry out outburst. She said, there's nothing wrong with losing my temper. I blow up and it's all over. Billy Sunday looked at her and said, just like a shotgun. And look at the damage it leaves behind. And, and that's true as well. Uh, with, with our, our tongues and our anger. Getting angry sometimes can be leaping into a wonderfully responsive sports car, gunning the motor, taking off at a high speed, and then discovering the brakes are out of, out of whack. Uh, off you go, and you can't pull it back. In the spring of uh, 1894, the Baltimore Orioles came to Boston to play a baseball game. What happened that day, however, was anything but routine. The Orioles' John McGraw got into a fight with Boston's third baseman. Within minutes, all the players from both teams were down in the field. They were fighting, uh, and then the conflict went into the grandstands. The fans began fighting. Somebody set fire to the stands. The entire ballpark burned to the ground. Not only that, but the fire spread to 107 other Boston buildings as well because one man lost his temper. That's the kind of damage it does. When you lose your temper, you lose more than your temper. You could lose your job. You could lose your family. You could lose the respect of other people. That's why Proverbs says in, in Proverbs 14, 17, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. All right, there's the questions. Now let me give you a couple of basic truths. First of all, a lack of self-control can lead to ruin. Proverbs 25, 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. In ancient times, cities had walls built around them to protect them against attackers. When the walls were broken down, there was no way to protect their city, and it usually would end up in ruin. Do you have some strong walls up in your life? Some walls of control uh, where you've asked God to give you uh, to help you have self-control in some weak areas. The Bible offers several examples of people who lived out of control. One of the most dramatic was, uh, was Samson uh, in Judges. He's a portrait of self-destruction. He was one of Israel's judges. The Spirit of God had empowered him, and he was known for his tremendous strength. And he actually led God's people for 20 years. One of his primary tasks was to protect them from the influence of the pagan Philistines. But because he didn't have enough self-control, 
Instead, he visited Philistine women. Uh, and he let one Philistine woman, Delilah, talk him uh, out of his secret to his strength, uh, which was his hair. Uh, and uh, he, he told her, he, actually, he was letting his hair grow because he had made a commitment to God, uh, and that was part of it. Uh, and so she has some guys come in and cut off all of his hair. Uh, and because he lost control, self-control, he lost his hair, he lost his eyesight, his life. Now, he took some Philistines with him as he went, but he just utterly destroyed his testimony. King Saul was another man with a deficit in self-control. He was so determined to destroy David that his life just spun completely out of control. He, he ignored the important things in his life in order to chase David all over the place. David, on the other hand, dis- demonstrated remarkable self-control. A couple of times, at least, he ended up very close to where Saul was, where he could have killed him, and he didn't. He would leave something behind so Saul knew he'd been there, but he chose not to kill him. David said, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is anointed of the Lord. Now, tragically, several years later, David, that king, gave up his self-control, and he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and murdered her husband Uriah. Now I find it interesting, even in the New Testament, Paul had the privilege of presenting the gospel to a man by the name of Felix, a Roman governor. And when he preached to him in in Acts 24, verse 25, he chose to emphasize righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix had no self-control. He indulged in all kinds of cruelty, in all kinds of lust, committed murder, committed adultery numerous times. But Felix was no different than many others in the Roman Empire. Scholars tell us that when the Roman Empire was disciplined and controlled, it became a a glorious empire, a wonderful empire, a great nation. But when it lost its self-control and its discipline, it lost its glory. Drunkenness, lust, orgies, And anything goes mindset caused Rome to cave inward and actually implode upon itself. The decline of the Roman Empire went hand in hand with self-indulgence. Don't you see the same thing happening in the United States? Because of self-indulgence, we're crumbling from the inside. Now, I know folks are worried about terrorists, and I don't like the thought of them either. Uh, But I honestly believe when America crumbles, it's not going to be because of terrorists. I don't think it's going to be because of another nation. We're crumbling from the inside. We're doing exactly what Rome did. Uh, And we've thrown out our morals. We've thrown out our self-control. We've thrown out our discipline. uh, And it's it's leading to, to tragedy. Felix responded to Paul's preaching like a lot of folks do today. Basically, he said, all right, that's enough for now. Uh, You've made your point. When it's convenient, I'll call for you again. But there's no record of him ever calling for Paul to come back and talk to him. And I wonder if Paul went back if his sermon would be on self-control, because that was Felix's problem. Benjamin Franklin had it right when he said, he is a governor that governs his passions, and he is a servant that serves them. And that's exactly what God's pointing out to us. If the Spirit of God is in control and we're walking in the Spirit, then we'll have self-control. We'll be temperate. But if we're not walking in the Spirit, we're going to lose that thing. We're going to lose self-control and all the other fruit. Uh, It's not going to be obvious in our lives. The second great truth is this. Self-control means giving control of myself to Jesus. It's a simple truth. You and I can never control ourselves in our own strength. So our only hope is surrendering ourselves to Jesus who lives in us. Uh, In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That doesn't mean that you deny yourself something like chocolate. It means you deny self. Self is your sinful nature. It's your personality that always says, gimme, 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 gimme. And Jesus is saying, you need to deny that and say, Lord, all I want to do is please you. All I want to do is honor you. Jesus in me 
will say no to the wrong things. Folks, each of us need a supernatural power within us for the strength to say no. And that's what Jesus does when you surrender control of your life to him. Titus tells us in Titus 2, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. God says you can do it, but you can't do it on your own strength. You've got to lean on the Lord in order for that to happen. But self-control is not just saying no to the wrong things, because Jesus in me will also say yes to the right things. The struggle within you is not like the cartoons you see with, with a good angel on one side and a bad angel on the other, you know, one's telling you to do bad, one's telling you to do good. As followers of Christ, if you're saved today, you have another option. Jesus lives in you, and he always says yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. So you only need one angel, and actually that's the Lord Jesus himself. What you need to do is say, yes, Jesus, I surrender myself to your control. Folks, the choice isn't about just doing right or wrong. It's the choice of whether or not we will allow Jesus to make that choice for us. More than 2,000 years ago, some people in Jerusalem made a choice. They didn't like what Jesus was preaching. They didn't like the fact that he was telling them they were sinners in need of a Savior. They didn't like the fact that he was telling them he was that Savior that came for them. And so they, they roughly beat him, whipped him, tortured him, flogged him, and then they nailed him to a cross and jammed that cross into a hole on top of a hill with two other criminals. And they laughed and they scorned and they mocked him. But that same Jesus stayed on the cross. He could have called legions of angels to come down and take him off of that. He could have stepped off of himself. He was God in the flesh. But he stayed there. And he bled and he died showing control. He bled and he died in agony so that our sins could be forgiven. Three days later, he walked out of the tomb alive, no longer dead, because he is God and he is the Savior. The key to displaying each of the nine character qualities that we call the fruit of the Spirit is not to try harder, but it's to understand the short phrase that appears right after the fruits are listed in verse 23. Against such there is no law. That means these characteristics can't be legislated. They can't be enforced by a set of rules. You can't make somebody kind or patient or gentle. Likewise, no law can keep us from displaying the Spirit's fruit in our lives. The only thing that's keeping us from allowing His fruit to ripen is our own sinfulness and our own selfishness. Like many of you, I've been watching the news. I watched the tragedy in Paris. And then another one this week is a hotel uh, many were killed there, uh, and uh, we see it happening all around the world. It's, it's a war that this world has never had to fight before. It's not like you go against one country. Uh, these are terrorists that are everywhere, uh, and they're coming at us. You know what the problem is? The problem is not Islam. That, that's another issue altogether. The problem is sin. These are sinful people who have no self-control, sinful people who have dedicated themselves to hate and to, to, to awful murder and torture. They're terrible people. But you know what? Without Jesus Christ, you and I would be just like them. The crowd that crucified Jesus, there were a lot of good people there. A lot of religious people there. People that normally just didn't do things like that. But because they weren't controlled by the Spirit of God, they murdered the Son of God. Murderers are all around today who are filled with the flesh, walking in the flesh, not in the Spirit. So let me close by telling you this. God says, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
Obviously, that's the key. Walk in the Spirit. But you can't walk in the Spirit until you know that there's a time in your life when you came to the Lord and admitted that you were a sinner. Admitted your sinfulness and asked Him to forgive you. Repented of it. That means you said, I don't want anything to do with that kind of life anymore. And you trusted Jesus Christ and His death on the cross to be the payment for your sins. God says, then you become a child of God. And when you do, the Holy Spirit moves inside, and He dwells inside of you. He's there forever. He seals you. You can't get rid of Him. He's there. He's the one that makes you feel miserable when you're doing wrong. Uh, He's the one that, that pokes you really hard when that happens. But you can't have that unless, first of all, you've invited Jesus into your heart. It's where it all starts. That's where it all begins. So I want to ask you this question. Notice, I'm not asking you, are you a Baptist? Are you religious? Do you go to church? I'm asking you, do you know that there's a time in your life when you ask God to forgive you of your sinfulness and you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and His death on the cross is the payment for your sins? If you have not done that, in just a moment, we're going to have an invitation song. I'll be right down here in the front. I want to encourage you to slip out and just meet me there and let one of our folks sit down and open the Bible and just show you what the Bible says about how you can be saved. It won't take long. Uh, Just a few verses we can show you in just about any book in the Bible because God talks about it all the way through the Bible about being saved. We want to show you how you can know that. We want to help you. But you have to let us. You have to show some control here. <clears throat> you have to control your sinful, sinful self and say, get out of the way because I want to know Jesus.